Uh, I, I don't know if you've ever had uh, something like this, but I often think that there are things that, that we have, gifts that we've been given, that, that just become such a part of the background of our lives that, that we don't realize that they're gifts. We, we just start to take them for granted. And so an example of this is, as a kid, I never gave much thought to the houses that we lived in, right? I, I just, they were just the place where, where we lived. And so I just kind of took them for granted. And it wasn't until I was an adult and had to buy my first house that I realized just how luxurious our house was, right? I, I grew up with an attached garage. Right? That, that's luxury. That's, that's nice. Right? I, I grew up in a house that had outlets, multiple outlets per wall, let alone per room. Right? My, my first house, you had one outlet per room. That's suffering. <laughs> right? that, that, that doesn't work in, in this day and age. But, but I never gave it much thought as a kid. I, I just looked at, at the, what we had, and it was just taken for granted. But looking back on it, I, I looked at, back on I think my dad provided very well for us. Right? We, we, it, those houses were a blessing uh, to our family. And the fact is that it is easy for things like this to be taken for granted. And I want to suggest to you today that Scripture is one of those things that we often take for granted. Right? Having a Bible in our hands and the, the ability to read it for ourselves is something that we've just grown uh, used to. It's just a, a part of the background of our lives. Like For you, maybe the Bible has just always been available to you. You've always had one on a shelf or, or by your bedside. Or maybe when you think about the ability to read, that doesn't seem like a luxury at all because that was something you, you achieved as a five-year-old or a six-year-old. And yet, we have to keep in mind that countless generations have come before us and yearned for this day, right? for a time when, when God's word would be accessible to the masses. And so we, we need to, to make sure that we recognize that that's a gift. And that gift... It came at a cost. It wasn't free. I want to share with you the story of William Tyndale. Uh, William Tyndale, he lived at, at the crossroads of history uh, when the printing press had been invented and it had finally come into common use. And so uh, finally, at last, right, books, the, these artifacts that were once rare and, and expensive, they were produced at such a level that anyone that could read them could have access to them. William Tyndale also lived in a time when the iron grip of a religious aristocracy was finally beginning to loosen over Europe. And so all of these factors came together, and one day uh, they revealed to William his life's mission. Uh, his revelation, it came in the midst of a debate with a doctor of divinity. In the middle of this debate, the, this doctor uh, declared the English is fine for the shopkeeper and the plowman, but it would never be suitable for Scripture. The debate between Tyndale and the doctor continued to heat up until Tyndale boldly proclaimed, I defy the Pope in all his laws. I intend to make it my, excuse me, I intend to make it possible for the ordinary farmer, for a mere plowboy, to understand more of Scripture than you do. And that's how it happened. That, that's how William Tyndale set the, the course and the purpose of his life. He was going to translate God's word into English. And so in 1523, nearly 500 years ago, William Tyndale sought permission and funds to start this project from the Bishop of London. The Bishop of London refused. And, and it quickly became clear that, that nowhere in England would welcome this project. And so he, Tyndale, he was forced to take his work to continental Europe, where he worked for two years translating the New Testament. When the New Testament was finished, Tyndale, he fired up those, those printing presses, and he began to send copy after copy across the English Channel to his native land. And when those books arrived, they were quickly bought up by church authorities, not to distribute, not to read, but to be burned. Tyndale would not be stopped. Rather than slowing his work, 
uh, his saboteurs ended up financing his ongoing work to translate the Old Testament into English. There was resilience there. We don't know who planned it or who financed the plot to take his life, but we know that it was carried out by a friend, a man named Henry Phillips, a man uh, accused of robbing his own father and gambling himself into bankruptcy. Phillips became Tyndale's guest at meals and became a trusted friend, one of the few people that Tyndale would trust with the privilege of seeing his books and his, his work. In May 1535, Phillips lured Tyndale away from the safety of his quarters and into the arms of soldiers. Tyndale was immediately imprisoned and accused of heresy for translating the Bible into English. Finally, in early August 1536, Tyndale was condemned as a heretic and kicked out of the priesthood. And he was delivered over to the secular authorities for punishment. On Friday, October 6th, after local officials took their seats, Tyndale was, was marched in, into the town square where they had erected a cross and they, they gave him the opportunity to recant. To recant of translating the scriptures into English. He refused. And he was given a moment to pray. And uh, John Fox, uh, English historian, records that as he prayed, he, he cried out, Lord, open the eyes of the king of England. And those were his last words. Because Tyndale was hanged and burned, giving his life to the cause of a plowman's Bible. See, you can buy a copy of an English translation of the Bible for less than five bucks. But don't think for a moment that it's cheap. Because others, other men have paid a much higher price so that we could have that luxury. Right? A, a gift that sits in the background is incredibly valuable. Tyndale paid a much greater price. See, we have an opportunity that countless of people have longed for, generations have, have dreamed of. Right? We have God's word accessible to us. Right? Physical copies in our hands and the ability and the education to read them. The story of William Tyndale, it reminds me that, that God's word is a gift and it, it encourages me to open those pages and to allow God's word to speak to, to my struggles. I think it's interesting how our adversary works. In, in Tyndale's day, he sought to, to make the Bible so revered, right? To have God's word so revered that it would be locked up in an ivory tower and the masses couldn't access it. And now in our day, that same evil plays out in the other extreme. He tries to convince us that God's word is so common, it doesn't warrant our attention. I want to remind us today that we have an opportunity to grow if we commit ourselves to the study of Scripture, right? We can dig deep through Bible study. If you have your Bibles with you or a device with the Bible app, I want to encourage you to open up to Psalm 1. I'm going to read this uh, passage in its entirety, and then we're going to uh, kind of look at some sections as we, as we go along. It says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked or stand in the way that sinners take. Or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is on the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night. That, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaves does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. Not so the wicked. They are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. But the way of the wicked leads to destruction. Uh, this passage makes it clear that there is a way that this world lives, right? There, there is a way that the wicked go, and there is a way that God is calling uh, his followers to go. There, there's a way that the righteous live, right? The blessed man. And the law of the Lord, or, or rather God's word, it unlocks that new way of living. And I really do mean unlocks. Uh, Judy was, was 
dead on during our worship service. He said, if it wasn't for, for God's word, we wouldn't know about grace. Right? If it wasn't for God's word, we wouldn't know about God's faithfulness through the ages. Right? If it wasn't for God's word, we wouldn't know right from wrong. We would be in a dark room, stumbling on our own. And we're not very good at that. It's like trying to grow fruit trees in the desert. You can plant them with great intention. But a harvest is never going to materialize. It would be foolish to to plant that crop in the desert because the, the fruit would never come. And yet, with good intention, many of us, that's how we approach our faith. We, we expect there to be fruit even though it's parched. Right? We, we, we're not studying God's word, and, and so we, we, are, we are empty. Uh, I want you to imagine if you could only eat one nutritious meal a week. Right? Just one, one time a week you got to eat, and it, it was maybe it's the, the best and the most nutritious meal that you can imagine. Would it sustain you? No, you would quickly lose strength and, and become weak. And yet when it comes to our faith, oftentimes that's, that's what we do. We, we go from Bible study to Bible study, or, or from, from worship service to worship service, without ever opening God's word and allowing him to nourish us. Now, having said all that, I don't want to be legalistic. I'm not here to try and guilt you or, or to shame you or, or to wag my finger at you. But I do want us to understand that God has given us this incredible opportunity. Right? This incredible opportunity to break free from the ways of this world. Right? We, we, can, we can be a people that understands the difference between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. Because God's word is, is accessible to us. It's there. And so I want to take a moment, I want to break down this passage, starting with verse 1 and 2. He gives us three statements here. He says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in the step with the wicked, or stand in the way that sinners take, or or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and who meditates on his law day and night. Psalm 1, we see a comparison between the blessed man and the wicked man. And that comparison starts with where their minds are at, right? Verse 1 gives us three statements that make it clear that the blessed man is living and thinking differently. It says, blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked. Some versions say, walk in the counsel of the wicked. Regardless of which version you are reading, the message is the same. We, We don't follow the advice of this world. Right? We're seeking truth from, from a different source. The way of God's people are, are living, uh, sorry, the, the way of godly, uh, godly people live and the way that the, the world lives are just fundamentally different. And so when we face struggles, probably the water cooler at work is not the best place to get advice. Right? The, the way you're going to approach your marriage and the way this world is going to look at your marriage is going to be fundamentally different. Right? The, the way that you're going to uh, face struggles and, and the way this world is going to face struggles are fundamentally different. And so we've got to be uh, investing ourselves in, in Scripture. The author of Psalms reinforces this by saying, or stand in the way sinners take. What this is saying is that the righteous, not only do they not walk the way the wicked walk, they, they aren't even in their path. Right? They're not even in uh, the same space. They're, they're not in, uh, the, on their route. Right? Metaphorically, we're in a totally different place. And the last statement says, they do not sit in the company of mockers. A mocker here is one that mocks the things of God. They, they, through their words and their actions, they're mocking God and, and they're rejecting his call on their life. Now together, this, this passage of scripture is clear that the righteous man he is separate from the wicked. He is living differently. He's, his priorities are in a different place. The way of his life is in a different direction. But as I read these, these verses as a high schooler, I, I misunderstood them. Right? I thought, oh, we can't walk with sinners. Oh, we, we can't be in, in the 
you know, we, we can't walk with, with wicked. We, we, we can't be in the, you know, we can't take the counsel of, uh, of mockers, or we can't be in company of the mockers. And so I understood this, that, okay, there are uh, people that I need to push the outer rim of my life. Right? That's how I understood this. It was foolish, but this is how I understood it. Right? That, that I needed to exclude those who, who rejected God, and I, they, I could reach out to them. Right? They, they could be my projects and my mission, but I, I couldn't have them be my close friends. And now I read this and I realize what, that, what a fallacy that is. The point of this passage is not telling us to exclude people from our lives. It's telling us that the blessed by God are different. Right? We're, we're not going to get to that place because we excluded and rejected people. We're going to get there because we're, we're intentionally meditating on the word of God. Right? And as we meditate on that word, God takes us through this, this constant process of adjustment to his word. Right? And so the, the blessed man becomes so obsessed with God's word that he's constantly thinking about it. He's constantly hungry for it. Day and night, he's mulling it over, seeking to understand it. Right? He's not di- driven by a, a sense of religious duty. No, we're, we're driven to God's word because we want to understand it. Right? We want it to reveal something of God. We're hungry for his presence. And so as we, as we, as we consume God's word, he does a work in us. And this is the, the most beautiful thing, that, that group of people, that the, you know, the sinners and the wicked and the, the lost around us, we don't have to exclude them. We become their invitation. We become an example of what it looks like to, to walk and to live differently. It's a beautiful thing. See, this is the, the, this is the thing. God wants you to be a person of depth and strength. That's what God wants for us. Every one of us in this room, God wants us to be a person of depth and strength. Verse 3 goes on and it makes this clear. It says, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season and whose leaves do, does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. I love everything about this image. Right? The strongest of plants is a tree. Right? Its roots go deep and enables it to, to withstand uh, mighty storms. Right? This, this passage tells us that, that the truth that we need, right, the, the truth that we need in order to be deep and strong, that truth, it doesn't have to be scarce in our life. Right? Have, you, have you ever gone through a time of struggle where, where it, it was just scarce, and so you felt empty, right? You felt parched. You, you felt frustrated and angry. You, you wondered where God even was in that moment because because it just wasn't there. But what this is telling us, I mean, if we're consistently consuming God's word and, and meditating on God's word, there can be an abundance of that truth when we need it. Right? We can take God's truth in and internalize it to such an extent that, that when the storm comes, we have exactly what we need to weather it. Right? When, when we see a, a loved one going through a hard time and, and the storm is, is devastating them, we can bring them in and let them find shade and shelter under us because we've got an understanding of God's truth. We've got something to offer. See, that's what God's calling us to. That's the picture that, that Psalms 1 is trying to give us. And all of this sounds good, but, but I want us to, to face something. There are reasons why we don't actively study God's will on our own. At least we don't do that as we should. I mean, some of those obstacles are, are quite simple. Uh, we face a lot of distractions. Right? There's a lot of things uh, calling for your attention on, on a daily basis. And, and so uh, if we're going to be students of God's word, it's going to be because we intentionally chose to do that. Right? It's not just going to fit easily into your day. You've got to make a choice. Where am I going to carve out that time? When, when, when can I reflect? And then we've got to make it happen. Another obstacle to uh, studying God's word is, is it's hard work. It is hard work. 
Now, I, I believe that the Holy Spirit can reveal God's truth to anyone. Right? It doesn't matter if you're a young child or, or a full-grown adult. It doesn't matter if you, you have a high IQ or, or if you're simple. If you've, if you've got the courage to open those words, I believe the Holy Spirit will speak to you and, and you, will, you will come to understand things about God. Right? But that being said, we also have to admit that the Bible is not a simple book. Right? It, it is a complicated book, and it is at, in places difficult to understand, and it takes work. And oftentimes, we are discouraged by the effort that that takes. The last thing, uh, obstacle that we face is that reading God's word leads us to uncomfortable questions. Right? It leads us to uncomfortable questions about God. It can lead us to uncomfortable questions about ourselves. It, it can lead us to uncomfortable questions about the society that we live in. And, and if you're like most people, most people don't like uncomfortable questions. They just as soon keep them out of their view. And, and so reading God's word means you're going to open it up and you're going to face some things that are going to make you uncomfortable. They're going to require you to wrestle, and they're going to stretch your faith. And so the question is, how do we overcome these obstacles and unlock the benefit of the spiritual discipline plan? The first one I've already touched on, and that is, first, we need to consume God's word regularly. Now, I've spent a lot of time as a youth minister, and every time I teach about daily Bible study or the discipline of Bible study, I always have at least one kid who, who sits there and says, ah, I hate reading. I, I'm not good at it. And I have no doubt that there's people here in, in this room who, who feel the same way, right? Looking at text on a page isn't the way that you enjoy pulling information in, right? It doesn't mean that you lack intelligence. It just means that, that, is a, that pulling information in that way is, is not your preferred choice. But see, this is the beautiful thing. We live in a day and age where that doesn't matter. Right? If, if you don't want to read the text, get the Bible app. It will read to you. Right? <laughs> right? We, we live in a day and age where there are podcasts available to you 24-7 explaining God's word in detail. We live in a time where God's word is more accessible to us than ever before. Right? It's all there. But we still have to make an intentional choice to make time for it and, and to reflect on it. We need to consume it regularly. We're only reading God's word occasionally is like exercising occasionally. Now, if you've ever started exercising, it's painful. It's, it's hard. It's not fun. Right? But if you exercise consistently, eventually it gets easier. And it even becomes enjoyable. And there's all kinds of benefits to your, to your physical body if you exercise consistently. But if you only exercise sporadically, well, it never gets easy. Right? It never becomes fun. And all of those potential benefits are lost. It doesn't matter even if you sporadically exercise for years. All of those gains are lost. The same thing's true when it comes to Bible study. Sporadic Bible study remains difficult. Right? It, 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 remains, it remains hard. The, the results that it's going to bring in your life are, are going to be diminished. But if we consistently study God's word, it gets easier. Right? It, it, and it produces excellent results in our lives. See, meditating on God's word constantly offers us that constant stream of water that Psalms 1 is describing. The second way that we overcome the obstacles to, to, spirit, to studying God's word is we dig into the context. One of the issues that we face in studying the Bible is that it has gotten a lot harder to understand because we have transitioned from a culture that was largely biblically literate to a culture that is largely biblically illiterate. Right? And what that means is that there are some of us that we have grown up in, in the culture around us shared the stories of the Bible. And because we, we grew up in this environment, we get it. 
right? We have a head start on understanding the context uh, of those passages. But then there's others of us that were raised in settings where we didn't share those stories. And so even as an adult, those stories still seem foreign and confusing to us. And this is because we don't have an understanding of the context. To understand scripture, we need to also understand the history. We need to understand the cultures. We need to understand the people. We even need to have some understanding of the geography and the languages that, that God's word was birthed in. And for many of us, that can seem daunting. That can seem overwhelming. But there is a way through it. I've always been intrigued uh, with the idea of rock climbing. It looks fun, right? <laughs> you don't think so? I've always thought, hey, that, that, looks, that looks like an adventure, uh, you know, doing amazing things in, in beautiful places. But if you were to bring me to a cliff and tell me to climb it, I wouldn't have the foggiest idea where to begin, right? Because I've never done it. For me to be successful at rock climbing, I, I would need a couple of things. I, I would need uh, some tools. I, I, I need uh, some safety gear for sure, right? Some ropes, some carabiners, maybe a hard hat. And, and once I had all the, the proper gear, well, and proper gear and tools, well, then I'm going to need a teacher. Right? I'm going to need a teacher to, to kind of show me how, how to, to, to climb over those rocks and, and to advance up that cliff. Now, I believe if I had those things, I, I could uh, grow my ability. doesn't mean it would come easy for me. It doesn't mean that I wouldn't have limitations when compared to other people. It just means I could grow my ability in rock climbing if I had the right tools and the right teacher. Now, understand the same thing is true when it comes to understanding the context of Scripture. Everyone can develop the ability, but you're going to need some tools, and you're going to need a teacher. Now, what do I mean by tools? Tools, in a nutshell, are anything, uh, usually books, websites, uh, e even podcasts, that, that explain the context of a passage of Scripture. Right? These tools... Uh, they, they can be teaching about history, they can be teaching about culture, the language, the geography. They unlock these things. They take areas of knowledge that are outside of your, uh, your knowledge and, and they allow you to get a glimpse of it. And so the simplest tool is, is a study Bible. And if you don't have a study Bible, I'm going to tell you right now, you need to get a study Bible. It is the simplest tool that, that we can use and it's so, uh, so beneficial for us. A study Bible, all it does is, is it's a Bible with the text, and then the margins of the text, it has the most common questions that people ask. Just little nuggets about the geography, about the language, about the history, about the people, right? Now, the good news is that these tools, they're, they're more accessible to us than ever before. Right? It used to be that, it, that if you wanted to be a student of the Bible, getting tools meant spending a lot of money on, on, a, on an expensive library. But again, we live in a day and age where we don't have to do that. Right? Sometimes uh, studying God's word, it can start with just a question in the Google search bar. Right? Because so much of this, the, these tools are online, ready uh, for you to, to make use of. And so this brings us to that teacher part. Because I don't know about you, but I would not watch a rock climbing video on YouTube, and then go tackle that 100-foot cliff. Right? Like, like, I probably would watch the video, but I would also need a teacher. Right? I would want someone that I have a relationship with. I would want someone that had some experience. I would want someone who knew how to climb that rock. Right? I would want a teacher that I'd seen evidence in their life that they know how to climb cliffs. Right? The same thing's true when it comes to a, a teacher of Scripture. We're, we're looking for the same thing. We're looking for someone that we can have relationship with. Right? Somebody that can know us. Somebody that, that we can see into their life and we can see that, that they can handle Scripture uh, credibly. And, and we can tell because we see the evidence in their life, that we see their character and we see their actions. And so we can know that they're, they're a safe uh, teacher to follow. Now, if you've got the tools, there's a lot of stuff you can try on your own. 
lot of exploring you can do. But inevitably, you need to have teachers in your life that, that can help walk you through the tougher stuff, that can help you apply it. The last thing that we need to, to overcome uh, those obstacles to Bible study is, is we need to build upon it. The purpose of Bible study is not the accumulation of knowledge. The, the purpose of Bible study is to bring about life transformation. And so far too many uh, people have accumulated Bible knowledge but failed to apply it to their lives. You know, that's where it stops. Gets into their head, doesn't make it to their heart. I had a roommate in Bible college that, that was a Bible Bowl champion, right? National champion. This kid, he had memorized whole books of the Bible. I'm not talking the easy books. I'm not talking like those little ones in the New Testament. I'm talking he had memorized First and Second Kings. Right? Like he had memorized entire books of the Bible, and, and he was, had a brilliant mind. And yet, he wasn't building his life on Scripture. Right? As a result of all his competitions and his success in Bible Bowl, he had uh, scholarships up the wazoo. And so he found himself at a Bible college, and he was my, my roommate that first semester. And I spent most of that first semester trying to convince him and his girlfriend that Jesus was for real. I said, there was truth there. Right? At that time, they were going through a season of experimentation with, with Buddhism and, and, and pot. See, it's not about knowing God's word. It's about building our lives upon it. James, he puts it this way. He says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. Bible study becomes like a mirror for us. Right? It becomes something that as we stare into the pages of God's word, we, we get a, a clear picture of who Jesus is. Right? We get a clear picture of who we are. And some things become obvious. The perfection of Jesus becomes obvious as we study Scripture. And our imperfection becomes obvious as we study Scripture. And it's as we study Scripture that we come to understand what we can do to better reflect Jesus in this world. Let me ask you this. What do you do when you look in a mirror? Right? You immediately look at the imperfection. Whether you want to admit it or not, when we look at a mirror, we, we instantly start fixing our hair. Right? We, we, we adjust our clothing. We, we maybe even pop that zit or suck it in the gut. Right? Even for a second. Ever do that walking through a, a clothing store? You get the mirror, suck it in. <laughs> yeah, we, we immediately see the imperfections and we, we target them. We try to correct them even just for a moment. That's exactly the role that Scripture is meant to play in our lives. Right? This is what it means to build our lives on the Word of God. We, we study God's Word so that we can understand ourselves, so that we can understand God, and so that we can work with the Holy Spirit to bring about life transformation in our lives. Scripture tells us that we are to reflect the nature of Jesus into this world. Bible study is essential to achieving that. Right? If we look in the mirror... If we don't look in the mirror, we, we don't get the details right. It's like getting dressed in the dark. If you get dressed in the dark, you're going to be a mess. Especially if you wear makeup. Right? You're going to be a mess. And so th this is my prayer for us. My, my prayer for us is that we would be a congregation that is, that is in love with God's word. Right? I, I pray that we would be a congregation that, that it is normal for us to open God's word daily. Right? I pray that we can be a congregation that the conversation that, that fills the air is, what's God teaching you? What you've been reading? What, 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 what preacher did you hear this week that, that, that encouraged you? Right? The, the, the fruit of God's word should just fill our conversation. Because this is the reality 
If that's who we become, if that's who we choose to be, man, we will be that, that, that tree, right? Fed by streams of water. We can be a shelter to the lost. We, we can be a refuge for the hurting. Right? This isn't about legalistically checking off the duty, right? Oh, God, got to read my chapter today. Oh, no way. It's about becoming the people that God's called us to be and taking full advantage of all the gifts that he's given us. Praise God that scripture is accessible to us. Praise God that, that we have the freedom and the ability to understand it, to read it. So let's commit ourselves to that. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I come before you grateful. Grateful for the sacrifice of others that, that has put scripture in our hands. Lord, I come before you grateful for the teachers that, that have helped us to understand and, and given us a, a working knowledge of your word. Lord, I pray that you would put a hunger in each one of us, that, that we would crave your word. Lord, when we open it, we pray that your Holy Spirit would just uh, open our eyes, that we would see Jesus clearly, that we would see ourselves clearly. And Lord, that, that we would be just drawn uh, towards you, that, that we would uh, become the people that you're calling us to be. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. If you are here today and it is time to take the next step in your faith, I want to encourage you to make that known. Um, maybe your next step in, in faith is that, that you, you need to get baptized, right? It's time to, to give your life to the Lord and meet him in the waters of baptism. And if that's where you're at, we can make that happen. Uh, the baptismal is always ready. If you're here today, maybe the next step in your faith is just to commit to to opening God's word, that, that you're going to get involved in a Bible study, a Sunday school class. You're going to commit yourself to, to reading God's word regularly. If that's where you are, don't just make that commitment to yourself. Let us know. We want to encourage and be a part of that with you. And so we encourage you, uh, text steps to the number on the screen. We would love to encourage you in any way that we can.